spoke with authority. He never just speaks for speaking sake. He doesn't speak to excite people. He speaks the very word of the living God. And this is what a man of the Spirit. This is the purpose of the Spirit. Then look at verse 14. He says for that, that the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. So if somebody is arguing with what I'm saying right now, you are not of the Spirit, that is why you will not accept what I'm saying. For they are foolish to them, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually designed. It's very, very simple. If you speak of intelligence of man, academic knowledge, it takes an academician to understand it. In the field you are speaking. So, if you are speaking, therefore, of the Spirit of God, it takes somebody who has the same Spirit to understand it. So, if someone does not have the Spirit by which you are speaking, he cannot talk. As a doctor cannot talk when lawyers are talking. And a lawyer cannot talk when doctors begin to talk about how to operate human beings. They don't understand it. The languages they will be speaking, lawyer cannot. Is anyone lawyer is speaking all these, their five and language and stuff? Doctor is looking at them, he cannot. Now, similarly, if you are not educated in God, you cannot hear God's spirit. So when you speak by the spirit of God, only those who have the spirit of God, it will resonate with them. Even if they have not read any Bible before and they just born again illiterate when you begin to read the bible you say yes that is god because the spirit inside them is the same spirit inside you that is opening up mysteries to their spirit i we together now but to anybody who did not have the spirit it's foolishness that's the reason why I don't waste your time trying to convince a foolish man i told you we don't have such time i said something to you that you see when I came to recognize this, that if anybody comes to me uh, who has been under my teaching and is saying to me that he has a problem which I have taught about, you know, I don't pray for them. I will tell them to go and read, to go and listen to that tape. Am I talking to you because you waste my time? If my time has to be quantified financially, you know, it will be a waste of money too and waste of my eternity. Because if I spend 30 minutes with a person who will never yield, okay, that 30 minutes, is minus 30 minutes in my existence. When people come to me and say that, oh, they are not members of CFT. Oh, Apostle, I want to name my baby. I say, which church do you go? If you don't go to a church, you will have to accept Jesus first. Because this month is not for those who don't go to church, who don't believe in Jesus. If you don't believe in Jesus, whoever you believe should go and name your baby. You want me to name your baby? You don't know Jesus, you have to believe in Jesus. You have to accept Jesus first. Then I name the baby. The same thing, if somebody tells me that he wants me to name this baby, I'm using that for an example. I, I, I say, are you a Christian? I say, I'm a Christian. Do you go to church? Say yes. No. Then I can't name your baby because your pastor is the spiritual head in this. Oh, come and wed us. I will not wed anybody who is not a member of CFT. You know, woman I'm talking about. Because the woman church is the one who weds people, isn't it? So I will not bypass the pastor of that woman to go and do his duty. It is ungodly. Am I talking to you? So the same thing. You must understand this. If you have this spirit, you will understand what the spirit is saying. So when I talk to somebody who doesn't have spirit, I waste my time. Somebody called me, Apostle, Apostle, I want to come and give me a counseling. Are you a member of CFC? You are not. Are you going to a church? Yes. It's not my duty to counsel you. God does not ask from me about you, your pastor, go and meet. Because see those guys, the pastor might have been counseling them. They don't hear it. They want to come to waste my time. I don't waste time with fools. The Bible says a person who doesn't have the spirit is a fool. He's a fool. If there is dispute, I can go into it and sort dispute out. But to advise you, unless if the pastor where the church you are going is erroneous, and I will stand to tell you that it's, a, it's an erroneous church, this is why you are having all the problem you're having. This is scriptures. And I'll be, I'll be very much ready to stand before that pastor and say you are a deceiver. Any man under heaven, I will show you the reason why you are. But a person who will not accept spiritual things, don't advise them. Because all the time you are spent advising, 
you waste your life. You want to lend your advice to people who believe and who have the same spirit that you have. And they will do what you are saying. Because the man without the spirit does not accept. Finish that scripture, 15, and we end up in 16. The spiritual man makes judgment about all things. You see, you know, when you talk to a spiritual man, he will make judgment and he will apply. That's what it means. But he himself is not subject to any judgment. So, somebody came and told me that he's quarreling with this person and all stuff like that. I said, okay, speak. And he spoke. And I said, but you are guilty. Why? Look at what you said about yourself. Look at what you said. Look at what you said. What you said. I expect a person who came to report another person to accept his guilt first. I will not judge that person, your, your, your couple opponent, with your words. Because I have not seen that opponent. The Bible wants me not to do that. A man will not cause me to sin. Am I telling you? So when husband and wife have problem and the husband comes to me and spoke to me, I will listen and I will question you. And from my question, I will say that, okay, do you, first of all, you have a problem with your wife. Do you recognize that this thing you said is wrong? Do you recognize that this action you did is wrong? If you cannot accept your wrong, first. He said, what about my wife? It's not, it's your wife didn't come to me. You are the one standing before me. I'm judging you by your word. The Bible says by your word you will be judged. And if it's the woman too, I said, I will open up what you said. I will tell you what you have done wrong. Somebody I did that to walk away from Christ with tabernacle. Both husband and wife. They had quarrel with the, and with the brother, brother and the brother's wife. And they came to me and reported the brother's wife. And when they spoke, I questioned them. You know, people who lie, if you allow Holy Spirit inside you, it will tell you that this one is a lie. This one is a lie. Lie, 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 lie. Until when God gives you the same, you can see in the test of man, lie, lie, lie. Like this, your, uh, uh, this your light that, that uh, uh, yeah, that's it. Say exit, 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 isn't it? Exit, 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 <laughs> exit. You work with the Lord, you will begin to see. Lie, 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 lie. <laughs> so you let them finish all their talk. So when you finish all their talk, you now begin to question them in the areas that they lie. They will say, M -m 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 -m. So that's a lie, see? So you did this, didn't you? Yes, you did this, didn't you? You, yeah, you did this. So guilty or not guilty? If they cannot accept their guilt because they do not have the Spirit of God in them. A person who has the Spirit of God, if you quarrel with somebody else and he came to report, and you are judging him by his word, according to the scripture, by your word you shall be condemned, by your word you shall be justified. If he has the Spirit of God and you are telling him what he has done, he will say, ah, I'm so sorry, Lord, forgive me. That is the solution to that quarrel. Because then when we call the other party, and say that what happened, and the other party spoke. And you judge the other party by what he had done. You tell the other party that this, the first party already, has, he knew that this he did was wrong, and he has repented. He knew this is wrong, but you too. But you did this too, and you did this too, and you did this too. Don't you see the scriptures? That person has no option but to say, I'm sorry. So when both people accept where they have gone wrong, principle of mediation, it is resolve. That's what mediators do. Just to bring you to a place where you know they are wrong and, and a common agreement, and then the mediation collect money from you and send you out. <laughs> Amen. But I was doing this when I was not a mediator, but now I'm a qualified mediator. But I was doing this by the Spirit of God. And when I went to study mediation in my course, I discovered that this is what... I have been doing. I think every pastor should be given instead of chartered mediators. I mean, real pastors. <laughs> Not the one who takes side from one person and then two people in your, in your congregation are fighting. You take side of the one who is near to you. If you are near to me and you fight, for fighting at all, you are guilty. Yeah, if you are near to me, even if the person did you wrong, you, why didn't you come and tell me? That you went to take action. Who told you to take action? You want to drive away my members? When you are very close to me. So you are fundamentally wrong. Am I telling you? And if I tell you, if you have the spirit of God, you say, Lord, Apostle, I'm so sorry. Maybe because you represent my integrity. Have you seen me fight with any? Is anybody here I fought with you? 
Hallelujah. I hung the glove 1974. And since that time, I've never fought anymore because there's no more ring for me to fight. I now know I wrestle not against flesh and blood. And so, you have these two nature in you that work against one another. Let me just give you a few scriptures in the next five, ten minutes. I'll finish. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 17. It says, so I say, live by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of your sinful nature. That tells you the remedy to prevail over sinful nature. The remedy to prevail. Live by the Spirit. And I will end it up by helping you to know what are the practical things to do and you are living by the Spirit. All right? The Bible says so. Verse 17 says, For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spiritual, to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. You see the two natures in you? They will carry both nature in our body. Our body is still our body is sinful. And the spirit of God is inside us in our spirit, which is of God. And those two things, they desire what is contrary to one another. My, my body wants to sleep when I'm supposed to wake up. Isn't it? And the Bible says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of arms, poverty will jump upon you like arm robber. And if you're a Christian that you love your bed, poverty is your next door neighbor. And after some time, it will move into your bedroom and you become a co-tenant. Poverty. Because you love to, be, to sleep. When the Bible says, a little sleep, a little slumber, then you say you are fed or you are frustrated. Why? Because you have allowed the devil to be your neighbor. Depression is a spirit. Frustration is a spirit. Your life is worth a living if you don't have a penny in your pocket. There is hope for you for tomorrow if you are jobless today. That is the spirit of the living God. He will provide all your needs. Am I talking to you? But when you begin, when you don't exercise the spirit of the living God, you will feel that because you are jobless, your mates are getting job, and so what? And so what? The time God has set for you is different from your mates. Oh, all my mates are getting married, and so what? The time God has set for you to marry is different from your mates. Oh, all my mates are half children, and so what? It's better for you to wait for the choice child from heaven. You know, those things cannot, they cannot push you if you walk by the Spirit of God. Your time will come. I say your time will come. Yeah. Absolutely. You will not have to think or sit down one day to allow depression to visit you and knock your door. So it says the two nature combat in you. For the sinful nature desires contrary to the spirit, and the spirit works contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. Born again, you cannot do what you want. You must do what God wants. Is that correct? Say amen. Okay. What are, the sinful, what are the elements or factors of sinful nature? The acts of sinful nature. Look at Galatians 5.19. The acts of sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, feats of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions. This, write them down. If you find any of them in your life, kick them out. That is what praying and fasting for, that God will deliver you from them. Envy, drunkenness, urges, and the likes. That is what the world does. It sounds, who said to me that, ah, cocaine is not in the Bible. Did you see anywhere that God said, that shall not smoke? It is in the Bible. You know where it is? God is so intelligent. All the likes. All the likes. Am I talking to you? That's how some, 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 some people came to me, they are Christians, they said that ah, polygamy, polygamy is right for a Christian. I said, why? They said Solomon was polygamous, Daniel, David was polygamous. I said, did Solomon die for you? He said, no. I, did David die for you? I said, he said, no. I said, okay. You know, there are some Christians, they develop this theology big. If you go to, to the internet and Google it, polygamous fit for Christians, you will see so many nonsense they wrote. 
You know what I told the man? I said, may the curses of David and Solomon follow you. Your children will rape your wife in the public as they did to that David. Go and read what happened to Solomon by virtue of such. So you cannot tell me that this is what Solomon did. You follow it without taking everything evil that followed that. He said, say amen. He couldn't say amen. No. He couldn't say amen. You know, you, all these people who, you know, <clears throat> Satan is always foolish. If you read the word very well, no matter how stupid the Satan does and the person thinks that's intelligence, one word would disbalance them. That's how Jesus made him a fool when he applied, applied by the Jesus Christ. It's not in the Bible not to take cocaine. Hey, take cocaine. The Bible says it that all likes, all likes is so, you know, you know, realistic, and it, com it, co it, it, it contains everything that they may manufacture in the future. God is all knowing. So, if you look at the rise, the rest of verse 21, and envy, drunkenness, all years and like, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter what, how convinced you are. The Bible says you can't inherit the kingdom of God. It Bible says that when you do those things, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. Can Christians begin to do that and expect to die and be met with angels? No, the demon that controls you is the one who will first appear. The demon that controls your mind is where you will first appear. Because the Bible says that if you do those things, you have, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Both on earth and when you die. Because the kingdom of God on earth, it continues in heaven. Come on now, if I was you, I will run away from those things. I don't want all my labor. You see, it, when, when we go to church, and some people are, you see them on the road running, I would say, God, these people are not going to church, I'm going to church. Don't let me go to where they are going when I die. That's what would come to my mind. Some people don't serve God at all, they just serve themselves, they just do whatever they like. I say, God, look at them. Then you have people who are just very evil. I say, Lord, I must not end up where the witches and wizards go. So anything it will cost me on earth to follow God and be obedient, I will do. If you like, say I'm ugly. It's your business. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. As far as I'm concerned, I am handsome the way I am. I don't have to make my hair like this and cut my nose like that and put a, a, a nose in my, in my hair and even put a ring here and when I'm not ready I, just, I put a ring here I mean I don't have to be abused like that to please you I don't want to please you my friend whether I wear a, a, a 1,000 coat suit or I bought my suit in the market at a sales of five pounds. It's not your business. It fits me. If you say it does not fit me, it is your own word. My word is that it fits me. That's it, man. Whether you bought your own in Bond Street and I bought my own in Free Street. Yes. <laughs> at least I'm free. You are born. Come on now. Don't let those things move you. Don't let those things move you. I don't care how I look. Only my wife cares. <laughs> I don't care how I look. She put me, she put on me, kijipa, I wear. She put on me anything, I wear it. If you don't like it as long as my wife didn't complain, then what's your business? You live the same life, my friend. That's the scripture. It is the word of God. Yeah? Those are the things that Satan used to deceive believers. So now... What are the acts of sinful nature? That's it. But those who are in it cannot inherit uh, the kingdom. Where did the craving of the flesh come from? Where did it come from? We know that now this is the craving of the flesh, all these things I read to you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3 tells you, all of us, verse 3, all of us lived, like, um, like lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of sinful nature. Among who? Among... Verse 1 says, as for you, you were dead in your transgression and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. So the ways of this world is what is responsible for the craving, which is the prince of air, which is Satan. He's the one involved in all this craving. You know, they were doing, you know, some, something on television and you know, all these stars, they are star, gather. And a woman was wearing 
uh, something like uh, plastic, and it has triangle, triangle like that. You know, it looks like plastic. It's just dazzling. I don't know what they used to do that kind of clothes. And you can see all manners of dressing. They were all coming out. I say, oh my God. When this, the Lord Jesus saw them, they looked like those who are harassed. Those who are showing their breasts almost push the breast out of the cloth. Those who open their bombs and almost, you know, remove the bomb out like that. And they are calling them the celebrity. I say, oh my God, may their eyes be open quick. There is no celebrity in hell. The fire of hell does not respect your influence. Look at what the Bible says in that scripture. All of us used to live among them, gratifying the sinful cravings of the sinful nature, and following his desires. Like the rest, we were, we were by nature object of rot. Come on now. A Christian who is worldly is by nature object of rot. He has said that he will not inherit the kingdom. He has said to you yesterday that God will not answer him. Now he now says he's an object of rot of God. A, just because you are li listening to the prince of the air, you are, you are listening to what the flesh dictates. You want to be like the sons of Satan or daughters of Lucifer. Am I talking to you? Now, in conclusion, freedom in Christ is not a license to be reckless. Freedom in Christ is not a license to be reckless. Look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 to 15. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in sinful nature. All this... People, television evangelists who are telling you that it doesn't matter what you do as a Christian, you have the blood of Jesus cover. Cover what? He says, don't use it as a, as a license. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is, summon, is summed up in single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep, by, keep on biting either in the back or in front and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Then you must be led by the Spirit. Write it down. You must be led by the Spirit. Galatians 5, 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. I've told you that I will tell you what to do. The remedy to be able to be led by the Spirit. That's where we began from. What is being led by the Spirit? Now, answer. How to be led by the Spirit. Galatians 5, 24 to 26. It says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their sinful nature with his passion and desire. Check your passion, crucify it. Check your desire, crucify it. Then you are led by the Spirit. Led by the Spirit is not just some regulations that is so blows me. I have too many. Those who are led by sin have crucified their body. Your nature crucified. In another words, say no to your body. Say no to your passion. Say no to your, to your loss. So that you will not disgrace God again. Jesus again. I think that this is okay for us. So he says, since we live by the Spirit, verse 25, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. And I look at the word passion. It means strong and barely controllable emotion. Is that not addiction? Then desire, strong feeling and waiting of, of wanting rather to have something. Sometimes this deprive yourself of what you would love to eat. I just get away from it so that it will not control you. It's, it's just a discipline. If there is something, if I crave for it, I must have it, I must have it. Satan got you. Satan got you. He can kill you with, by that thing. You must not allow any craving to master you. You must not allow any desire to master you. 
and this is how to walk in step with the Holy Spirit. When you get home, read con the conclusion, Ephesians chapter 4, 17 to 32. I give you that assignment. And Romans, Ephesians 4, 17 to 32. And Romans 6, 1 to 22. They express, encapsulate all what I've been teaching you from Friday till this very hour. May the Lord strengthen your spirit and soul. When the roll is called up yonder, you will be there. May the spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead grant your mortal bodies life. May you master the cunning of this world that is brought by the devil. May you never fall victim of the enemy anymore. In the realm of your mind, may the Holy Spirit of God send fire into your body, fire into your mind, fire into your soul, and destroy everything that the devil has put in your spirit, in your soul, in your body. Be taken out by the fire of God in the name of Jesus and leave you purified. May the blood of Jesus work on your behalf. The work you have begun in your life shall not be destroyed by the devil. You will not be mastered by the cunning way of this world. In the mighty name of Jesus, the world passes away with its passion, God says. You will not be passionate towards anything that will take you to hell. The Lord will grant you discernment in your spirit, understanding in your mind, ability to subdue every thought and subject them to the obedience of Christ. May heaven open floodgates over Christ's faith tabernacle and pour out his unction to enable the spirit of righteousness, to enable the working in holiness and destroy every past that could take us to hell. May your focus be on the heavenly that we are going by Christ in the mighty name of Jesus.